you should separate it out into bubbles, right? Mm -hmm. Like small droplets, right? There's some issues there. So okay. People have tried to fix it for a long time. Okay. So that is a problem. Okay. okay. Um, so let's see. Uh, ah, I wanted to show you the videos last time. I could not, so here they are. Um, this is basically uh, this. These are some more videos in addition to the ones I showed you last time. So this, uh, I was trying to simulate one of the experiments that Professor Curet is doing here at CDEC. So he's looking at how cylinders. Uh, well, how mangroves basically reduce erosion of the coast. Mangroves are trees which have branches that, uh, several branches that look like cylinders that are uh, jutting into the water. So this is a two-dimensional simulation where this is the cylinder that comes out of the board, and the idea was to see how different arrangements can uh, lead to different drag or different levels of disturbance in the wave. And yeah, simulations are a very fast way of evaluating many different possibilities. And once you say, OK, this arrangement is better than that arrangement, you can uh, test, go and test it in an experiment. So this uh, helps. You don't have to do hundreds of experiments. You can do hundreds of simulations. Uh, here, the color is just vorticity. Blue is into the plane, and red is out. Okay, another thing that I did show you, part of this was so this is group swimming of fish. This is one of the big simulations that we did a while ago. And here what we uh, were able to wait, you cannot see. Sorry. Here what we were able to uh, basically figure out was that if you place the fish in uh, appropriate locations, there's this oncoming vortex over here that will hit uh, this follower here. And if that happens in a certain way, it can lead to reduced energy con consumption of the follower. And the sound you're hearing in the video is actually the pressure measured on the head. So it's uh, what you notice that when the incoming vortex hits, the sound level will go up and down. So it's background noise that's being modulated with the pressure level. I'll play it once more. visualizations like this for the simple problems that we will look at in class. Okay, so let's see. Uh, any questions, comments, anything from the last class or anything? Oh, all right. So we were talking about derivatives last time, and let me switch this. So we are talking about discretizing derivatives, okay? And we were uh, working with a very simple example of uh, parabola, right? And uh, these things are, you, some of you might have seen these things before, uh, but uh, we are all from very different backgrounds, so it's important that we are all on the same page. So it's, think of it as review if you already know this stuff. So we have y equal x squared, and let's say I ask you for the slope at uh, at x equals two, right? So 
for that, you will just differentiate and say slope equal times two equals four, right? Fine, that's nice. But for that, you need to have this nice function, right? There's a nice analytical expression for the function here. When we do numerics, this is not the case, almost never the case. We never have a nice continuous function given to us. Instead, what you will have is data points. So you will have a data point number one, data point number two, data point number three, number four, okay? And you might have the x, y coordinates here, zero, zero, one, one, uh, two, four, and three, nine, right? So now, again, I ask you the same question. Give me the derivative at x equals two, or the slope at x equals two. There's uh, very straightforward ways to do this. And we'll look at why exactly mathematically that's correct. So uh, right now you can, let's see, so this is, we know I've taken these points from parabola. So you give me three very simple expressions for the derivative at x equals two. Give me any three possible. Well, let's start with one. Give me one possibility of uh, finding the derivative. You mean the slope? Once more? You mean just the slope? Yeah, the slope. And so you could just take, like, I guess the y3 minus y0. All right. So you want to? Over x3 minus x1. All right. So you want to take these two points and compute right. the slope using these two, right? right? Yeah. Estimated here. Yeah, so that's something we can do. Let's see. So the slope is basically di minus 1 over eh, 1 minus 1. What? No, no, wait, wait, 3 minus 1. Okay, so it's 8 over 2 equals 4. Okay, so our estimate seems to be exact, right? So this is analytical. And this is a numerical estimate. And we will see today why this particular estimate is exact. Okay, give me another estimate. So you used point left and point right. How about if I want to use the, the point that I'm looking at and something else? Yeah, there's another poss possibility, right? So, yeah. I guess you could compute the slope between the first and second point and the second and third and then take the average. Right. Ah, okay. Yeah, that's that would be something more, uh, let's say, exotic. So you're saying take these two points, compute slope, take these right. two points, compute slope, and take the average. Right. If you do that, what you'll get is it'll be the same thing as doing uh, 3 minus 1. Okay. It, it'll give you the same exact answer. So, but yeah, what you were saying is, you, I can take nine minus four over three minus two, right? Which gives me five, okay? Close to the analytical answer, which is four, but not, I mean, it, it's okay. It's not perfect. Another slope is, uh, let's say four minus one over two minus one, which is three. Again, not perfect, but it's fine. So there's three different estimates that we've used just for finding the slope. If we write this in terms of, let's say, okay, let me redraw this. If I have uh, any, you know, any point i, so I have x i comma y i. So the first way that you said was take the <coughs> xi plus 1 and yi plus 1. Here's xi minus 1. And so this is called centered derivatives. Uh, let me just write it out. Here. Uh, okay. CDD. 
two. Y i plus one minus y i minus one over x i plus one times x i minus one. Right? These are subscripts. I plus one, i minus one. So this is called center difference two. Center difference two. Two because it's second order. Again, uh, I will explain what order means. The other estimate that you gave me was, let's say, by prime equal y i minus y i minus 1 over x i minus x i minus 1. Or the prime equals y i plus 1 times y i. Right? So that's basically what we did. This is just using symbols. We did this using numbers. So where do these come from? Uh, they, we can very rigorously prove that these expressions make sense. And for that, we will use the Taylor series expansions of that. Again, I'll keep redrawing the parabola if I have uh, y of x. And let's say we go a little bit further up. It's y plus x plus delta x. Or delta x is a small angel, right? So we know that the Taylor series expansion, y x plus delta x becomes y at x plus uh, Well, it's easy, so I'll just write it up. All right. So y prime of x delta x over 1 factorial plus y double prime delta x squared over 2 factorial plus so on, right? Okay. Can I remove the first page? Okay, so now, if I just rearrange these terms very quickly, we get y x plus delta x minus y x equals y prime delta x. So on. So from here, you can almost see that we already have the answer is y x plus delta x minus y of x over delta x is y prime plus y prime delta x over 2 factorial plus other terms. Okay. So this is basically what we had when we wrote uh, y i plus 1 minus y i over x i plus 1 minus x i. Okay, so is this exact? What I is what I've written here correct? It's an approximation. Yeah, this is an approximation. I've basically uh, removed these extra terms which were here, right? And we say these are order delta x terms. Order delta x terms. And they are higher order terms. These terms that we remove from our these terms that we remove from our approximation basically tell us how accurate our estimate is. Okay. So let's try a few more possibilities. Okay, let's see. So okay, let, let's just write this out first. So um, 
y prime is basically y i plus one minus y i over x i plus one minus x i plus or than I, I just rewrote it. Uh, you, again, you might be a little confused. Why does this plus prime become a minus? We don't care. Uh, we don't care what the constant looks like. We just care about the delta x, the power on the delta x. Okay? So, we could also have done this slightly differently. Instead of going to plus delta x, as we did here, so we went from yx to yx plus delta x. Now we can go the other way. We can go from yx to yx minus delta x. Okay? And we'll do exactly the same thing again. So, what is the series expansion of x minus delta x? It's basically yx plus f prime, ah, y prime, this time minus delta x over 1 factorial, plus y double prime minus delta x o squared over 2 factorial, and so on. Okay? And when we rearrange this, what you will get is uh, y prime is equal to y x minus prime x minus delta x over delta x plus again the same thing, order of uh, delta x. So I order of so delta x. Okay? If I rewrite this in terms of indices is just yi minus yi minus 1 over xi minus xi minus 1 over the x. This again is one of the estimates we had used for computing uh, of, uh, the derivative. Right? So all of this comes very naturally, mathematically. Okay, so um, Let's do one more uh, before I tell you what the significance of this order delta x terms. Okay. So uh, if I bring back the old paper, so this, <coughs> these two are what we have derived right now. So this was i plus 1 minus yi. This is going back. So let's, let's derive this one now, where we use 1 to the right and 1 to the left. And that we can do quite easily by combining the two. So let me write out the Taylor series expansion. So uh, now let's derive CD2. Okay. So for that, we write out expansion for both. Uh, let's write one more. Let's also take the fourth derivative. Let's do the same with x minus delta x. And so our plus delta x becomes a minus here. And we have a square here, so we retain the plus. And uh, odd term gets negative again, and the even term gets a positive. Now, tell me, do you see a pattern between the two? Let me draw out a line to separate these two. So let's call this A and let's call this B. Okay? 
do you see a pattern that can we combine these two in some way to get rid of some terms on the right? It's subtract. Okay, yeah, I can subtract A and B, right? See what happens. If I subtract A minus B, you get on the right, on the left hand side, you have okay, and on the right side, do you see this? Ah, okay, so y minus y becomes zero. And we get 2y prime delta x, then uh, where am I? Am I? Ah, y double prime minus y double prime becomes 0. Then we get 2y triple prime delta x cubed over 3 factorial. And again, a 0 in terms of subtracting these two, and so on. Right? So, what happens? Let's clean this out a little bit. What happens here is two y prime delta x plus two y triple prime delta x cubed over three factorial plus so on. Okay, tell me, what do you see now? Can we get an estimate for either the first derivative or the third derivative from here? The first derivative. Yeah, you can get an estimate for the first derivative, right? Y prime will be this whole thing divided by 2 delta x. And then we'll have some, I keep forgetting that uh, the recording doesn't show the screen. So um, that's it. I'll write it out y x plus delta x minus y x minus delta x over 2 delta x basically becomes an estimate for y prime plus order index order what? Index cube. Delta x cube? Alright. Who says delta x to the four? Alright. Who agrees with delta x cubed? All right, if most of you don't agree, what what should it be? Delta x cubed. Um, so, uh, I, I have Square. Wait. Del delta x squared? Yeah, it should be delta x squared, right? Because oh, yeah. I basically divided everything by delta x. So, ah. I basically divided everything by delta x. So this delta x cubed becomes a delta x squared. So the remaining term is delta x squared. OK? So if you remember, we did, with our numbers here, we did a 9 minus 1 over 3 minus 1, right? So that was basically going to yi plus 1 minus yi minus 1 Right? And that's what we have recovered here. It's uh, y i plus 1 minus y i minus 1 over 2 delta x, which I can also write as x i plus 1 minus x i minus 1, is another estimate for the first derivative. And its order of accuracy is second order accuracy. So now, what, what does this order uh, order term mean? Why, why is this useful? Order delta x versus order delta x squared. What this tells us is how quickly this uh, estimate will converge to the correct answer. How quickly your error will drop in this estimate. Okay? Um, we compare this to the other uh, estimate we had, let's say y prime equal 
y i plus one minus y i plus order theta x, right? So that was another estimate. Uh, what this is saying is if I start decreasing my delta x, the, the, the estimate on top will converge to the correct answer, the analytical answer, faster than this one. Okay? Uh, in, in practical terms, if I decrease my delta x by 2, so if I make my, if I have my delta x, in this case, the error will also have, right? But in the first case, if I have my delta x, what will happen to the error? The error will drop 10 times, 20 times. What is 4 times? 4 times. If I decrease my delta x by 2 times, here, uh, yeah. if I decrease my delta x by 2, the error will decrease by 4. So that, that's basically what order of accuracy means. So let's see. Here, order of accuracy is two. Two. Which means for every decrease in delta x by uh, n times the error drops by n squared times. Okay? Means, uh, if I drop my delta x by 10 times, the error will drop by 100 times. So in, in that case, you see the expression is, the first expression is much more useful than the second expression. There are caveats to using very high order estimates, um, but we'll, we'll take a look at those later on. So now, what does this mean? If I use y prime, uh, the second order y prime versus first order y prime, am I always guaranteed to, can I always for sure say that the error here will be smaller than the error here. Do you understand what I mean by error? See, if we, we, we made an estimation of the slope here, right? But it's not correct. This is, and the numerical answer is five, but the actual answer should be four. So that's an error. And this error will keep dropping if I uh, decrease my delta x. My delta x here was one. 3 minus 2. Uh, and if I take more points here, so if I take many more points, the, the, we, I, we won't get such a huge error. It might become 4.2 or 4.1. So it'll be closer to the correct answer. So that's what I mean by decreasing that tax. You, you basically use more points to discretize your uh, function. So, um, yeah, so my question was, anytime you see a second order accurate expression, can you with confidence say that, yes, the error is guaranteed to be smaller than the first order expression? Do you get the question? Right? So did you ask it? Once more? No, I didn't get the question. So the question is, um, over here, we had a first order estimate for the slope and a second order estimate for the slope. In this case, yeah, we see the error in the second order estimate is nothing. Right? So we are guaranteed to get smaller error in this case. Are we guaranteed to have that for any case? And for, you know, is this uh, an ultimate truth that the second order error, absolute errors, will always be smaller? No, it's not true, right? So the reason.
reason for that is here there were coefficients in front, right? There was a y prime, y triple prime over six times two. So those coefficients we have gotten rid of. But it can happen that the coefficient in front of this delta x squared term is larger than the coefficient here, right? So it can happen that the error here is more than the error here. But what we are guaranteed is that this error will drop much faster than the first order error. Okay? For instance, let's say if I keep refining my grid and we go to delta x over 10, this error will already have dropped 100 times, but the other one will only drop 10 times. If you look at that on a graph, and graphs like this you will make during the project and homework. If we plot the error, and the, for the simple case we're talking about, the error can just be analytical derivative minus the numerical derivative. And you can take the absolute value, right? That's one possibility of depicting error. And if we plot it against the number of grid points, What will it look like? Uh, uh, so, so I don't confuse you. If we think back to our uh, rod, uh, the heat equation, that example that we were looking at, number of grid points is inversely proportional to uh, delta x, right? So if I have uh, one, two, three grid points, my delta x is L over two, right? If let's say it's L is one meter, so delta x would be 0 0.5. Now, if I increase my uh, n to 5, let's say, what we have now is delta x is L over 4, so 0 0.25, right? So decreasing delta x means increasing the number of points, okay? So on this graph, um, we're plotting it, increasing number of grid points versus the error. What, what will the curve look like? Will it go up, will it go down? The, the error will go down um, linearly for the first order All right. equation. So the error will go down linearly for the first order. Yes, that is correct. Right. Um, and we get another color. So, uh, okay, let, let's treat this as a schematic, okay? So actually, you plot log of error versus log of delta x. So you always get a linear curve. So if I were to think of a second order curve, which is also a straight line, what would its slope be? Would the slope be greater or smaller? More negative, less negative? It's going to decrease more rapidly. Yeah, it's going to decrease faster, right? So it will decrease much faster compared to the first order. So let's say this is the first order convergence. Remember we talked about, okay, uh, it's not absolutely necessary that the first order answer is worse than the second order. Can you see that on this graph here? Uh, uh, in the beginning, the error of the first order is smaller than the second order. Yeah, exactly. So if you look over here, in this region, the first order error, the absolute error, is actually smaller than the second order error. But at some point, 
the second order will become better. Okay? So this is the only thing that order of accuracy means. Okay? And uh, it's it's important to use good schemes that are that show good convergence because otherwise the number of grid points you might need might destroy your computer. Uh, it, it will choke it up okay? because the RAM is limited. So in the cases we are talking about now, this is not a problem. I mean, it's a simple parabola, so not, not too much trouble. But if you go to the full Navier-Stokes equations, this becomes a problem. Okay? Think of even, let's say, a thousand points in each direction. If you have three dimensions, that's a thousand cubed number of grid points. And uh, so the number of grid points that you have to handle increases very quickly. So you always prefer to uh, decrease your error in your numerics as fast as you can. Okay. All right. So any questions at this point? No. So um, if we go back to this, how we derive this center difference, there's something else we can do, right? You said do a minus b. What happens if I do A plus B? Will we get something different? Oh yeah, we'll get rid of the... What will we get? We'll get rid of the odd terms and keep the even ones. Yeah, we'll get rid of the odd terms if we do A plus B, and we will keep the even terms. So let's do that. Uh, I don't want to rewrite the whole thing, so. basically added the two terms. Um, all right, so let's clean it out a little bit. Let's see, this becomes y x plus theta x plus y. So two y x plus uh, two factorial is then y double y delta x squared plus two y four four. Tell me, what, what is this useful for? Estimate for second derivative. Yeah, this is a numerical estimate for the second derivative, right? We see that. We see the first term here is the second derivative and higher order terms are fourth derivative, etc. So if we rearrange this, what we get is y x plus theta x minus 2y x. Let's divide throughout by delta x squared. So this becomes y double prime plus order. Delta x squared. Delta x squared, right? We added delta x to the 4. We divided everything by delta x squared. So the remaining term is order delta x squared. Okay. So this is a second order accurate estimate for the second derivative. Okay. And if we write this as indices, it's just y i plus one minus y two y i plus.
So this is second order accurate estimate of second derivative. Okay, so should we stop here? Can we keep going? We can, right? There's a uh, there's a um, delta x squared term which we could potentially get rid of. We just get a delta x cubed or a delta x fourth term, and all of, all of this happens in the same way that we have done it. Okay, you combine different expressions and then you get higher order estimates. And let me switch to uh, the source of knowledge, Wikipedia, for a second. has a whole list of the different expressions for the derivatives. So if you want the first derivative and you want it to be second order accurate, you take y minus 1, y plus 1, and multiply them by half. Right? That's exactly what we uh, did in, uh, well, that's exactly what we derived. For us, the derivation was, let me see, can I switch back and forth? Without causing me him. Um, where is my highlight here? Perfect. Wait, oh. One second, I've lost my ah, here. Right. Okay. So if we switch to the docucam again. Here, this expression is y i plus one y i minus 1, and both are multiplied by half. You see the 2 in the bottom here? So that's exactly what the Wikipedia table was saying. Here you have a y i minus 1, y i plus 1, and that's the half. Okay? And if you want a fourth order accurate estimate, you would need to go to left and to right, and you don't take the centered one. Okay? And then if you look at this row here, this is the second derivative, right? This is what we derived right now. This is the second derivative, order of accuracy is 2. We have 1 left, 1 right, and the center one multiplied by minus 2. And if I bring back the formula, it is, where is it? It is here. Okay. So here. Plus 1, minus 1, and minus 2 for the center. And on the bottom, there's no, there's a delta x squared. Okay? So that's what the coefficients, uh, if you go through any finite difference text or any website, that's what the coefficients mean. And we can, again, com keep combining these things, uh, just using the Taylor series expert to get higher order uh, estimates. Okay? So, now we know what finite differences are, now we know where they come from. Let's go back to our very simple but very useful heat equation okay, that we were trying to discretize. So, uh, all right, going back to the heat equation. Because del t over del t equal kappa uh, lambda squared t. Okay, capital T is temperature, small t sign. This is the, what is this called? What is kappa? Thermal diffusivity. Yeah, it's called thermal diffusivity or conductivity. Okay, so it's called diff. Or conductivity. 
and this is a property of the uh, material that we might be looking at. For instance, the metal or plastic. Okay, the thermal diffusivity of plastic would be much smaller than the thermal diffusivity of steel. Okay. Uh, this equation does not only is not only restricted to the uh, evolution of temperature. It, you can also look at um, species of chemical mixing in water or uh, gas. And the way, if you just put a blob of, uh, let's say, ink in a glass of water, the way it diffuses out throughout the water is governed by this same exact equation. If you want to uh, include more things like advection, then there's an extra term that we add on. And that's called the advection diffusion equation. We will take a look at that uh, in, uh, in, in a few classes. OK, so now we know how to deal with derivatives. And let's say we are only dealing with a single spatial dimension. So let's say this del root t over del x squared. Okay, let me redraw our rod that we were looking at. Say this is a metallic rod, and uh, its length is one meter. Okay, is the equation enough for me to solve? Or T. Do I need more things? What do I need? Initial conditions. Boundary conditions. Excellent. We need initial condition and boundary condition, right? So we need initial conditions. Uh, let me say initial condition is initial condition is just what the temperature in the rod looks like at time equals u. Okay. Initial condition is left end is uh, 100 degrees centigrade and right is 80 degrees centigrade. And this is kept, the ends are kept at these temperatures throughout the experiment. Okay. That they're not allowed to change. I'm sorry, this is not an initial condition. This is a boundary condition. We're just talking about what happens at the boundaries. And then initial condition might be that, not 80, let's say 20. The initial condition might be a linear distribution from left to right. Okay, so at time equals zero, the temperature would look something like this. This would be at 20 degrees, and this would be at 100 degrees. Okay? Let's make our rod a bit bigger. All right, perfect. So, what is the first thing we need to do if we want to solve this numerically? Can I give the computer, okay, there's a rock here. I gotta give a data point. Yeah, we need to create data points, right? You need to discretize our rock. So let's discretize it into one, two, three, four, five, five segments, right? So we would say I goes from one, two, three, four, five. If you like to start at zero, fine. Uh, and X would be, 0, 0 0.5, 0 0.25, 0 0.75, and 1. Because I told you the rod is 1 meter long. So now I know the coordinates at each of these x, i. And what is the initial temperature? So 100 here. What's it here? At the midpoint. 160, 40, or 60. 60, yeah, it would be 60 degrees. Okay, here we know it's fixed at 20 degrees, so here it will be 40 degrees, here it will be 80 degrees. Yeah? All right, everything 
make sense? Okay. Now, fine, we have discretized our data. Now let's discretize our uh, PDE, uh, partial differential equation. Uh, all right, then I'll let you do this for me. So, what will, let's do the right hand side first, okay? So, this becomes kappa times something. What is the something in here? D2 t by dx squared. How can we write this numerically? Yeah, this is just nothing but the second derivative of time. And just 15 minutes ago, we were we had uh, derived an expression for the second derivative, right? Where did that go? Yeah. There. So our y now becomes t. So t double prime will be pi plus one, blah, blah, blah. Right? So let's write that down. So, um, this is, okay, I'll leave that. t i plus one minus two t i plus t i minus one over delta x squared. Uh, now, one thing I've done here is I've divided the rod into equal in intervals, so I don't need to keep writing x i plus one, x i minus one. I can just say delta x. Delta x here is 0 0.25. Right? Make sense? Okay, what should I do with the left hand side? The left hand side being the time derivative. Time derivative. Only talked about space derivative when we were talking about deriving these things. These expressions, is this only valid for x plus delta x? Maybe t. 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 Yeah, this is a general expression valid for anything that goes in here. So I, I add y x plus delta x, y t plus delta t, I don't care. So let's use a very simple expression for the. Uh, Time derivative, the first derivative in time. Let's go for t n plus one minus t n over delta t. This is the forward derivative, right? Uh, okay. Now, you see, there's something weird happening. We have n on the left side and i's on the right side. Okay, so there's something missing. What what am I missing at the moment? Does this, is this equal? Is this comparing potatoes and potatoes? No, apples to apples. <laughs> My advisor used to say comparing potatoes to oranges. Uh, yeah, he was French. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, so we are not comparing apples to apples at the moment, right? But it's, it's, there's nothing to it. We said the superscript represents time here, and the subscript represents Space. Okay? So we're just saying at any given node, my temperature at the next time that I'm trying to find out will be this whole expression, which involves temperature at that same node at the current time, n. And on the right side, what should I put on sub superscripts? N or n plus 1? N. All right, I can put n. Would it be wrong to put n plus 1? we have to change accordingly on the left. Yeah, it would not be wrong to put n plus 1, but that makes the computation uh, quite a bit more expensive. Because then, on the right-hand side, we have things that are unknown, right? I don't know any t at n plus 1. And that's called an implicit, uh, implicit uh, discretization of time. And what we have done right now is explicit discretization. Right now, the only unknown we have is that n plus 1. Everything else is known. Okay? This is much simpler to solve. And, but at a later point, again, we will look at implicit time integration. Okay, so uh, let's 
take an example in and write it out explicitly. Let's say for i equal to. Now, I will let you tell me, and n equals 0, okay? I will let you tell me how to fill it in. You, you dictate and I will write. So, go. T1. One where sup superscript on um, two minus T one or T zero two divided by delta T. Okay. T zero three. Minus two T zero um, two plus T zero one. Excellent. Yeah. So now, since I, I have been given the initial condition, I know all these T zeros, right? That's what I wrote out here. Okay. So now we, we can basically basically plug everything in. Okay. Now, one thing I did not give you is the value of kappa. So let's say kappa is ten meters squared per second. Um, <coughs> why meters squared per second? I will tell you later, maybe. So, now, and ah, uh, what about delta t? Where does delta t come from? What is delta t? Delta x is easy, right? I divided up my rod into these intervals, which gives me delta x is 0 0.25. Where does delta t come from? Depends how often you sample each data point. Once more? Depends on how quickly you sample each data point. Yeah, that actually depends on you, right? It, that the T comes from, okay, I want to see the time evolution very, very accurately. So you take that the T very small. Or you say, okay, I don't really care about the time uh, evolution that much. I just want to get the steady state answer. Then you can take a larger delta T. But there's a limit to how large you can take together. And that we will see when we talk about stability, again, at a later point. So let me say, uh, let me pick delta t equals 0 0.015, okay? So now I have everything to fill out this uh, t2 at step 1 is unknown. So that remains as available. What is T2 at 0? T2 at 0 is here, 80 degrees. Over 0 0.01 equals 10. That's what I said kappa was. Times 0 0.25 whole squared. Uh, what is this? T3 0 is what? 60 degrees. Minus 2 times. What is uh, T2 on T2 on uh, T2 0? 80 degrees. So now the only unknown remaining is T21, and we've uh, we basically figured out what temperature at node number two will be at the next step. Next step being 0 0.01 second from the current time. Okay. So I can do the same for everything, right? I can do this for T31. Minus blah 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 equals blah blah blah, and I can do. Um, let me take a pressure. I can I can keep going like this. T four of one minus things equal to right. Okay. So at the end, uh, what I've done is I have figured out T two, T three, T four at the next time step. But is that all? I mean, my I goes from 1 to 5, right? What, what should I do with 1 and 5? Let's write out this, uh, this discretized form for I equal 1. Um, all right, you, you tell me. What, what should I write? Isn't the boundary condition set? Yeah, exactly. So if, let's say, we didn't realize, okay, that's the boundary condition. We would have started writing it out, but we would run in trouble. Here, let me show you this very quickly. So this is T1 at 1 minus T1 
on the zero color, there's a T2. Uh, T2 at 0 minus 2, T1 at 0 over delta x squared plus I minus 1, I is 1, so T0 doesn't exist, right? There's nothing to the left of the first point, so I, I, I don't have this. And at this point, someone might realize, oh, I don't need this upper. We've been told that the left end is always held at 100 degrees centigrade, and the right end is always held at 20 degrees centigrade. So you don't need to solve for T1 and T5. Okay. So once we have all this <coughs> T2, T3, T4 at step one, now I basically know the whole rod's temperature distribution at this next time step, right? And now I can keep going. Now I will do the same thing for time step two, okay? And for time step two, what will happen is, let's see, n equal two, which is the second time step. What we have is, again, I will just, this is the main equation. If we try that, it will be two. T2 minus T1 at and let's say I equal 3. Right? So it will be 3, 3 over delta T or kappa delta x squared T4 at 1 minus 2 T3 1 plus T5 at So now I have this for loop in MATLAB, in Python, in C++, in Fortran, whatever program you want to use. And now this loop can keep going until you hit an end time. Let's say you say, after time equal 10 seconds, I don't want to simulate anymore. So you keep evaluating this sequentially until you hit time equal 10, right? And this corresponds to time equal 0 0.02 seconds. So that's how we solve this thing numerically. And that is going to be your first project. To do basically what we did on paper here, to write a code to do that for 1B, uh, heat diffusion, uh, yeah, for diffusion of heat in a 1B domain, basically a rod, as well as a 2B domain, which can be a rectangle or, uh, or a square, right? It can be a sheet of paper or a sheet of metal. You can hold one side to a certain temperature and then figure out what the temperature distribution in paper is. Okay, so any questions up to this point? Anything at all? Yeah. So when we were expanding uh, for the derivatives mm -hmm. using the Taylor series, can there be some better way of expanding that? I mean, can we use something like Fourier series or some other series? so that we get a better approximate for the derivatives? Uh, there is a way to do, uh, to, S, to basically compute derivatives using Fourier transforms. That's called spectral methods. We might cover this later if there's enough time. Uh, but that uses Fourier transforms. So, but that has issues. Uh, I, I will tell you what these issues are. Is. If you have an, uh, a jump, you can get ringing, terrible ringing at the jump. Uh, yeah, but we'll come to that later. Yeah. Um, when we substituted in the Taylor series um, expansion, why didn't? Why, why did we leave out the error term? Uh, you mean the order? Yeah. Why does it, this become this? No, why didn't we include that error term in the, the heat problem? Oh, uh, okay. So, because I replaced my double prime, the second derivative, with this uh, expression, right? Mm -hmm. I can include more terms, but then that would be higher order accurate, but then I would also need to include more grid points. Here I'm fine with just going right, center, left, right? Mm -hmm. If you use higher orders, you might have to go 
two, two left, two right, mm -hmm. four left, four right. Okay. And this becomes a huge problem when you start doing uh, distributed or parallel computing. Mm -hmm. Uh, I will again cover that at, at some point. Okay. So you're still going to have the error though from from that term in the solution. In this, yes. when you use this exact thing, yeah, you will have some error. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so in numerics, you never get the exact answer. Your goal is to get the error to be as small as is useful to you. Mm -hmm. okay. And you never shoot for you know exact answer because. Mm -hmm. There's something called machine precision. Are you familiar with it? Sorry. So machine precision is uh, any computer that does mathematics does not do exact mathematics. So there's always a very tiny error, which is usually 1 e minus 16. Okay. So you're not guaranteed exact mathematics in a computer, ever. Mm -hmm. And the more you demand in terms of that accuracy, the more time it will take for your computer. So most usual thing you can do is 1e minus 8. That's called single precision. Double precision is 1e minus 16. And then nobody usually uses anything higher than that. Mm -hmm. OK. So yeah, in numerics, you always have some error. And your goal is always to control that error. That's why we care so much about this convergence and order of accuracy. All right, more questions? Yeah. On that assignment where you said to simulate the play, mm -hmm. what are going to be the boundary conditions for the whole? OK, so the question was, if you have a heat equation in a plate, what would you set the boundary conditions to be? And that can depend on what physical problem you're looking at. If you say one side of the plate is heated to 100 degrees, then that's okay. that's called a daily play boundary condition. Uh, let me write that down. It's called Dirichlet. And the other one, where you say the derivative might be some value, is called a Neumann boundary condition. Okay. So here, specify uh, value d equals something, and here you specify the derivative del t over del x equals something. And we looked at one problem, right? So the rod was perfectly considered at the end. So that in that case you were specifying the spatial derivative. So that's a Neumann boundary condition. So you just want us to make up the boundary condition? No, no, no. I will give you the so I will give you use these boundary conditions and simulate for this time, this is your conductivity. So I will, I will give you all that. Okay, more questions. Okay, let me see. Um, I can actually show you what version control is. Uh, let me see, is there anything else I need to tell you about this? No, ah, one more thing, yeah, okay. So, now, do you know what mixed derivatives are? I mean, yeah, probably not. Mixed derivatives. For instance, you might have del 2f over del x, del y, right? You might have partial with respect to both x and y. How do we estimate this? I will give you one small hint. This you can write as del x, del f. Almost never have partial uh, mixed derivatives in uh, fluid mechanics, but it's still useful to know. Okay, then we gave you one more hint. This is equal to del. Um, well, uh, if I give you another hint, it'll be the answer. So it will be like uh, first del f by del y at uh, x plus something minus del f by del y at x minus something divided by. Okay, let me write down what you said exactly. Okay, 
del f i del y hat uh, x plus some point let's say i plus one here yeah. minus, minus del f i del y at i minus one over divided by two times delta x. Perfect. Does that make sense? Yeah, he's done nothing. He's just treated this as a function of g, right? So this is g i plus 1 and g i minus 1 divided by 2 delta x. All right? And now, that's somebody else tell me what next? same thing. Yeah, we'll do the same thing exactly here. So now we have f of i plus 1, uh, comma. What do you want? k. k plus. Stick with j. k, i, j, k. k is usually the z, z component. Okay. So j plus 1? Yes. All right. Minus? Uh, f of i plus 1, uh, J minus one divided by uh, I guess delta uh, two delta y. Uh -huh. Right. You see what it is? You just expanded this term to this, and now we can do the same for the other one. Mm -hmm. If I have enough space, uh, f of uh, i minus one comma j plus one. Minus f of i minus one comma j minus one over two delta y, right? So that's that's a very straightforward uh, expression for the mixed derivative. Okay, this is the only way. Can you think of another way? So we started over here. Right? I can do it the other way. Well. Yeah, you can do it the other way. You can also uh, or say. Del two f over del x del y is you can you can swap the derivatives right? so it's fast you, you could have done it like that so you see it's it's all very simple very straightforward and all of this is used to do the simulations that I showed you in the beginning okay. So we have uh, roughly five minutes. So uh, I won't be able to show you. I will show you next class, but I can talk about it. So have you heard of the term called version control? No. So what happens when you usually write code? It's usually one file, right? It's uh, maybe if you use MATLAB, it's one script or maybe four scripts. And if you've done a big project using that, in that way, uh, you would you know, start off with something, a small code, and then every day you would add on, right? You would keep adding on. And at some point, you make a mistake, and then you don't, don't know where the mistake started. Right? And then, you know, if you're unlucky, you have not saved your progress. So now it becomes a one-week ordeal of trying to figure out where the mistake is. If you're a bit smarter, you might have said, okay, every day I will make a backup. Right? I will say this is a directory from day one, directory from day two. And by the end of, let's say, two months, you will have 60 different directories. Okay? Again, not a very elegant solution. So uh, the best alternative to that is using version control. Okay? What version control does is you write your code, and once you're at a point where you're happy, you say, okay, I wrote this small thing, it works, you save it, you save a snapshot of it. Then you write more, and then you keep saving snapshots as you progress. And the whole history is basically stored for you. And you can go back and forth anytime you want to. So anytime you make a mistake, you say, ah, four days ago I had this version which was working well. Let me pull that from the repository, and you know, then I can figure out very quickly where 
right? Let me say that. And everything is stored, so you can compare the two versions, the four day old version and the current version. So it's an absolutely necessary tool if you start working on big projects. So all companies use it. If you go to Google, they will use it. Microsoft, anybody who does any coding uses version control. Another good thing is if you work in big teams, it allows you to work on separate files at the same time, and then you can uh, you know, commit to your changes separately, and everything merges together nicely, usually. Um, so if you're working in large groups or if you're working on big projects, you have to use version control. And uh, all the homework that you will turn in, I uh, that's one requirement I would have for you. You use version control to write your code. Okay. Uh, and next class I will show you how exactly to you know, commit or you know to to save these changes and to move back and forth. So if you want, please bring your laptops and we will go through a quick demo in class. Uh, the distance learning students, I guess you can we can Skype if you get stuck at any point. Uh, version control works the easiest with Unix systems, Mac and Linux, but Windows has some programs too, so we will uh, install those. Um, there's like about 10 commands that you need to be familiar with, that, that's all. So if something new you will learn, it's something that might be a little tricky to learn in the beginning, but it will be useful for you for the rest of your life. Okay, so yeah, we'll do that next class. Any questions? All right, so I guess we can stop at this point because we have two minutes. All right, so let's see you next Tuesday. And I will try to put up the first homework sometime before the next class. All right.